Hi, investigators. Mike Evans here with the weekly roundup of news in the investigation industry in Australia, which is supposed to be a 15-minute program. We've got that much news this week. It's going to go a little bit longer. I do apologise for that, but we've got a lot to get through this week. So I thought the biggest news of this week was going to be the Australian Security Academy's new website is up and running and you can go and have a look at it. Just, just search for australiansecurityacademy.edu.au and that was the beginning of my week when I thought that that was going to be the biggest news of this week. Well, <laughs> As things turned out, it's not even on the radar with news that's been happening in the private investigation industry around Australia this week. Um, firstly, congratulations to uh, Naomi, who last week provided some feedback to us about this program. And Naomi, she won a Australian Security Academy coffee mug. And you can see the coffee mug there. It's a really great little item for private investigators. So congratulations, Naomi, on getting your coffee mug. And um, I'm sure you're holding that in your hand right now and uh, enjoying it. So uh, anybody who's got any feedback on the program they want to give me, you might win a coffee mug too. So last week, we discussed the matter of rogue private investigators using police databases to access information on people they were doing surveillance on. And we looked at that and um, how it's such a common thing. We also looked at the case in New South Wales where a rogue private investigator actually committed blackmail or extortion on a person who he had interviewed a few months before uh, and he was extorting money from that person, some $26,000, I think, from memory, to not tell his wife that he had a profile on Tinder. So the extortionist, who was a private investigator, was pretending to be a woman and extorting money. Now, this got a lot of interest from people. And people wrote to me and they said, is extortion something that private investigators get involved with, not as the actual protagonist, but as an investigator of it? And it, it brought back um, from the archives um, a matter where we had in um, our case files, we had an extortion case. Now, we didn't know it at the time, but they had as their mark a very wealthy lady and we did not know that she was identified and her wealth was identified by a bank teller. And the bank teller was in collusion with this person to commit this extortion. Now, the extortion demand, um, I can't say what the, the extortion was over, it wasn't over... Um, any sexual or perverted matters uh, or relationship matters, but it was an extortion. And she took it seriously and she was prepared to pay them $50,000 for what was being extorted. Now, you and I both know it would never end there. It would go on forever. And so she was told not to engage the police, so she contacted the private investigators and they became involved. Now, the extortionist was very well spoken the threats were very real and serious and it was taken seriously by us now if you're going to commit extortion you want cash you want it in a plain brown paper bag and you want a drop off point of that cash now this was all arranged and we got three hours notice only really early in the morning of where the drop off point would be now that three hours notice led us to a um, construction site, which was a, a commercial property under construction, but it had access into it and out of it. And luckily we got there and we set up the hidden cameras inside. Now, the extortionist had been really professional up until this point. As we were leaving through the back door, the extortionist pulled up in the driveway, in his vehicle, in the driveway. Now, 
They don't do that. They put the place under surveillance. They watch from a distance. Um, they, they never park nearby because that's going to expose the vehicle. And why would he be going in there? He arrived three quarters of an hour earlier than he should have been there. So here's a reenactment of the case. Here's our extortionist in the building. This is a reenactment. It's not the actual video. He was there 45 minutes earlier. He parked his vehicle in the driveway. Now, that's as big a mistake as you could possibly make. He didn't know he was being filmed by the hidden camera. And one of the really strange things about this blackmailer and extortion is his last name was actually Ransom. And the incredible thing was when you looked at his vehicle's registration in the driveway, this is what it said. Never, uh, nevertheless, he never got his money. He never got out of the building by himself. He was escorted out of there by two uniformed police officers. So, yes, extortions do happen. And they do engage private investigators in those roles with it to investigate them. Now, um, a lot of people have been um, discussing on Facebook lately the use of private investigators to conduct surveillance on people who are not fulfilling their isolation commitments for the COVID-19. Now, this is really interesting because some investigation agencies around Australia have been involved in it and others are developing their capacity to do that. Now, it's been discussed quite freely and, and people um, are getting paid to do it and have been engaged for it. So it's happening and I don't know whether it will really take off. I have no idea. I don't know whether um, it's going to be a big thing. What I do know is we will get a lot of university students coming back into Australia. Now, university students coming back into Australia when they fly them in, they're going to have to go through their 14 days isolation. Now, they, they will get here and uh, most of them, I guess, uh, would go and self-isolate for 14 days, but you're talking about 18 to 23-year-olds who are going to want alcohol, drugs, parties, that sort of thing, um, and they really want to be socially active, so they may be put under surveillance. I don't know. So in terms of that, um, it may be happening. Now, the really important thing you've got to understand about federal surveillance is that if you are going to undertake federal surveillance and work for a federal government department, you are going to have to go through the vetting process. Now, the vetting process means they're going to check your background and your character. Being a licensed private investigator is not enough to work for the government in an investigation role. So they are going to check out your background, check out your criminal history, check out your associates, your connections, your political views, your relationships, substance abuse, that sort of thing. So if you hit any one of those um, red flags on that, oh, sorry, you're not going to be doing surveillance as a private investigator for the federal government department. So keep that in mind. If you're in a Facebook hate group at the moment, get out of there. Right, it's an investigation Facebook hate group and you're in there, you don't want to be associated with that, you want the work, get out of there right now. So keep that in mind. Now, let's say um, we want to look at how all that works. Maybe, say, the investigator is a rogue investigator that slips through the system. One of the vetters has the flu or a bad day and just ticks the box and that investigator um, goes out and starts um, doing investigations. Now, on, as with the theme from last week, that investigator is going to use his um, cop mates to get into the database system so he can get regos and all that sort of thing. So let's say it's me that they are doing that investigation on. Now, targeted through the federal government's identification of um, uh, people um, to do surveillance on, here's me being in a radical protest in Melbourne, outside the Melbourne GPO with my Quaker friends, I'm seated in the front row, far right, and we're protesting about whatever, and that's what Quakers do. So we're there protesting silently. We're a real pain in the backside for the federal government because when we meet, we, we don't meet in a church or a mosque or something like that. We meet in a meeting house and we just sit there and we quietly contemplate. We don't say anything or, or mention anything or radicalise people uh, verbally. We just sit there. So having recording device, devices in is pointless. So here I am. I've been identified as a radical protester in Melbourne and the rogue private investigator needs his ex-cop mate to help him. So what's he going to do? 
well, let's have a look at what he would do. So here's our backdoor investigator. He's contacting um, his sergeant of police mate and he's finding out what vehicles I've got, um, what my wife's vehicle and rego is, and he's found out when it's booked in for a service and he's getting all this information. So this investigator is going to get a result and he's going to be seen like the superman of investigators. They see how much I've got in the bank and how much tax I owe and I haven't registered my dog. And that's what they do. And this guy's gone and done that 21 times. Um, that's a five-year in prison penalty for that. So what's that, 105 years in jail. He's risked to do that. And basically he's hoping he's going to get lots of video of me and get lots more work because he gets results. Well, that doesn't work. That's what the dumb ones do. So they get caught, the investigator and the police officer. The police officer loses the job. The investigator loses their licence. What do the smart ones do? Now, this is the critical question. There are people that do this and get their police mates to do it, and they get away with it. Now, accessing a police database, you've got to have a reason to do it. So you must type in that reason, um, whatever that reason might be. And that gets a bit lame after a while. But there are actually police databases that are there for urgent reasons and you don't need you don't need to have a reason to go in there. And it's called the firearms registry. Now, you jump into the firearms registry and it's really important because you can get in there without any permission requirements, that sort of thing. It's urgent. This guy's got guns. It could be best in violence or terror. So procedures are cumbersome and slow things down. We need an instant answer. And from the firearms registry, then they can go and find out what registered cars I've got, even though I haven't got any guns, and they can go and find out what registered um, dogs I've got or vehicle, whatever they want to find out. So that's how the clever crooks get round it. Well, they did up until today because now that they're all aware of that in the police, they'll be checking that from here on into the future. Now, probably the biggest news to come out of the investigation industry this week in Australia is this little pearl of news here. It's the Victorian Private Security Industry Issues Paper that has been in process of being uh, capacity built for the last two years. And you can now, using that address on the screen in front of you, get in touch with the Victorian um, licensing people and fix any issues you have with licensing. So what is it you've got a problem with? Is it a national license? Is it the licensing process and fingerprinting? Is it the fact that um, there's too many crooks operating in the industry with criminal records and it's too easy to get a license? Whatever your bugbear is, you can now get online and use, just stop the replay of this video at the point where you see who to contact and the issues paper is there on the internet. You can um, Google it and you can have your professional say on what's going to happen to licensing in Victoria. Are the training courses long enough? Are they good enough? Are the trainers qualified enough? Um, should all the students have to speak and read write English if they graduate from a security course in Victoria? You can say that in that license. Now, this is a complete bombshell because it's as unthinkable as a police royal commission would have been in the mid-80s in Queensland. So they're asking for your help, and it's not the licensing services division that are asking for it. It's the Victorian government. So if you've got an issue for licensing in Victoria, how they do it, um, the requirements to meet it, you can have your say as a professional investigator today. So that is um, something that, that's been an absolute bombshell that just came out of nowhere this week. And here I was thinking that the Australian Security Academy's website was going to be the biggest news of the week. Now, so keep, keep watching that, participate in it, give them your two cents worth, and it's really, really important that you get involved with that. Now, one of the confessions I have to make this week And I don't want this to go any further. Let's just keep this between you and me. Um, I have a private investigator badge. Yep, I know. You're a bit disappointed. I'll show you a photo of it. There it is. It's my 
private investigator badge given to me by the Association of Investigation and Security Professionals in Victoria, and it says integrity and discretion. And that's the badge they gave me when I joined that association. So it's really important that you understand there are types of private investigator badges that are perfectly legitimate. So they're out there. <laughs> I've got that one. Um, don't forget that at the AIS who gave me this badge, my private investigator badge, it's half price membership at the moment. So you get membership for half price and you get your private investigator badge as well. Now, that's quite controversial. So the other thing I've got to tell you is I don't just, uh, I don't know, it's been hard to confess. I don't just have one, I've got two of them. There's my second badge. It's the AIPI badge, which I'm a member of. So now I've got two private investigator badges. So I only opened them up out of the plastic bags yesterday. It's the first time I've ever had them out of there. Just to show you, that's what you get when you join an industry association. Now, if you're really excited about this and you want a private investigator badge, you've got to get it into perspective. Um, that's what they, they look like. You saw it there. They're the badges you get when you join those two associations. How big are they? Yeah, they are next to an Australian one cent piece. So if you want to coerce people into the back of your surveillance van by pretending to be a private investigator with a badge, you're not going to get away with it with a badge that size. All it means is you're a member of an industry association. So that's the badge you get when you join them. Job of the week. Now, the job of the week this week um, which we have uh, selected from <laughs> numerous investigation industry jobs is this little beauty here. It's with Australian Air Services. Now, you can see it on our Facebook jobs page and I think it's the Government Investigation Opportunity of the Year. It's written there in capital letters. They want to pay you over 3000 bucks a week plus superannuation to clean up the bullying bullying and the code of conduct um, experiences and all the racial discrimination, sexual harassment that's been toxic and endemic in Australian air services for the last 10 years. They want to pay you as the manager to clean that up, three grand a week plus superannuation, and you have to be an investigator. Now, how hard is that going to be? All you have to do is figure out what knowledge, skill, information training or attitude gap has failed at Air Services Australia, sack the people that do the induction, sack the people that do the training, sack the people that have run the grievance or procedures and policies, get rid of them and with a new broom go in there and address the knowledge, the skill, the information, the training and the attitude gaps and fix it and get paid $3,000 a week to do it. So not bad. That's pretty good, pretty good money. So that's a great job. There is another job here that, um, oops, <laughs> we're live. Um, it's in Tasmania and it's for the Department of Families and they've got an investigation position vacant down there. So if you're in Tassie, have a look at our Facebook page that has the job vacancies on it. It's uh, full of job vacancies. We don't put them all up. Not every job vacancy goes up there for private investigator or for um, government investigator or whatever. We don't put them all up because we just haven't got time, but we put some valuable ones up there so you can see them. It's all getting square. Now, Getting Square is a really great movie. It's set on the Gold Coast and um, basically it's about a, a heroin addict and how he tries to go straight. Now, just give you a quick look at it and we'll have a look at what they the, the movie show people rated it. Just have a quick look at it. It's got Gary Sweet in it. David Wenham, Joe Bugner, the only man to go uh, 12 rounds twice with Muhammad Ali. And this is the really important part. This is where David Wenham is being left to think about um, what he's done before he goes and has his record of interview. 
And here's Margaret and David telling you Margaret's given it four stars and David's given it four and a half stars because it is a quintessential Gold Coast Australian comedy. Now, a couple of things they do in this movie that are really important. There's two scenes that are important. The first one is the one where David Wenham is isolated in the room by himself before he goes and has his record of interview. This is a common police tactic, okay? So police do this with criminals all the time. Government investigators use it as well. Private investigators don't forget that. It's never going to happen. But government investigators, and if you're an Australian Security Academy student doing it, government investigators do that, that tactic. Now, we had one um, recently in Queensland where uh, a car dealer would uh, take your very expensive European uh, vehicle and you were behind in your payments, you're struggling, whatever. He would become the solution to you for getting rid of that vehicle. So he'd sell it for you out of his car yard on consignment. And he was quite a good salesperson, this guy. So he had his own car yard. He was a very good salesperson. He'd sell your vehicle on consignment. And then on your behalf, he'd go and put all the money through the poker machines for you. Uh, you never saw it and you didn't even know it was sold. But he did that and he'd done this to person after person and ripped them off. Now, typical of the Gold Coast, there was no paperwork. There was no contracts. There was no evidence. There was, there was nothing. The Office of Fair Trading, who were handling the investigation, had a few statements from people uh, in relation to it, but they had no support. They had you know, no pictures of the vehicle, no receipt for the vehicle. They just relied and trusted this person would do it for them. Now, the Office of Fair Trading got this offender into their office. They had no evidence. They needed a confession out of him. And what they did, they isolated him in that room for an hour before they actually interviewed him. He sat in there and he thought about it, just like David Wenham is in Getting Square. And that's the reason I want you to watch the movie. You see a couple of really good tactics for government investigators. Now, he's there and um, basically um, waiting for that. Now, the car dealer sat there for an hour, thought about what he'd done, and the ex-police officer, who's now working for the Office of Fair Trading, went in and sat down next to him, and all he did was say, mate, what have you done? And the car dealer confessed to everything with all the details of every vehicle, make, model, registration, ownership, the whole thing, gave him a record of interview, confessed and signed for it. So that's a little tactic that you see David Wenham playing out as a part of a comedy movie, but it's there. The other scene in this movie that's really good for private investigators and government investigators is the courtroom scene. Now, in the courtroom scene, you've got to watch Getting Square to see it, but it's very entertaining and uh, it's actually based on a true story. And Chris Nist, the lawyer who wrote the uh, movie, um, he, he wrote that part of it based on what he saw in court. So something to watch, Getting Square. This week's movie, this is probably, I think, one of the most important movies a private investigator can watch. Now, we've seen Detective Dance. That was our first movie three weeks ago. Last week, it was Getting Square. This week, it's a movie you've all watched. You have seen it. You can hire it now at the um, CD shop for 10 cents for a year. Um, it's that old, but it is so crucial to investigators. Now, when you see it come up, you'll know what it was. You've seen it. Here it is. It's the movie Aaron Brockovich. Now, the concept of the Aaron Brockovich movie is there's a plant in a town that's poisoned the water, everybody's got sick, nobody will give any uh, statement or supporting evidence to the lawyer and Aaron who are the investigators on it, because if they cooperate with the investigation, all the employment in that town is shut down and stopped. So that's the basic um, concept of the movie. They're struggling investigators who can't get anyone to tell them anything. Now, the only part of the movie you have to watch as an investigator is scene 26. 
So hire it from the CD shop for 10 cents for a year and go straight to scene 26. In this scene, in scene 26, Erin goes into a bar to get a cup of coffee and this creep comes up and starts hitting on her. He says, I, 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 I know you. I feel like I could talk to you. Uh, I could say anything to you. And it scares her and creeps her right out. And she orders her coffee to go instead of having it there because she's frightened by, by this creep. And basically, um, as she's about to go, he says, what if I told you that I destroyed documents when I was at the Hinkley plant. Now, this has got Erin's attention immediately because this is the first person that's come forward and said they did something that was wrong in the place that employs everybody in the town. Now, he was creepy and scary, but he's got information. So she does exactly in the movie what I would do ran outside, picked up the phone and called a boss and said, this guy wants to confess. He said he destroyed documents. What should I do? Now, you're in scene 26 of the movie Erin Brockovich, which is today, through this very day, the largest civil investigation payout in insurance history. The advice that Erin is given by her boss, who is the lawyer, on what to do is to go and take a deposition. That means go and get a statement from him. But it goes further than that. The next part of the advice is what's so important. You can either watch the movie or tune in next Friday and I'll tell you what that was. So that's our program for today. I think I've covered our jobs, our movies, our um, surveillance. We've got all that. We had our extortionist, the dumbest extortion of it you could ever imagine. How could you arrive 45 minutes before the drop-off time in your car with your registration <laughs> for the identifiable to the person that dropped the cash off? Oh, that was just so sad. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show this Friday. We'll be back again next Friday. We'll be adding to our assistance program for licensing regulation authorities. That got a bit held up this week because of the situation in Victoria where they're now reviewing the security industry. This is just unbelievable information. They will not believe it in Victoria at all the investigation industry associations. They will not believe this is actually happening. Unthinkable as a Royal Commission into the Queensland Police in the 1980s. That's how unthinkable this is. So if you enjoyed the show, I hope you did. I hope you got something out of it. Send me some feedback. You never know, you might win a private investigator mug and um, who knows, certainly Naomi did last week, I'm Mike Evans from the Australian Security Academy.